got an interesting one for you today. This is the Lian Li O11D Evo. It's a new revision with massive changes from the existing Lian Li O11 line of computer cases. This one follows the more original O11D series where it's for larger computer builds. It's not like the Air Mini, uh, but it has some major reworks like the fact that you can invert it. And it's one of the most mechanically brilliant ways we've seen of inverting a computer case. It's so good that it's actually not a completely pointless gimmick. And that's pretty rare for us to say about invertible cases because it, it could be cool. It's normally extremely painful to do, but Lian Li has done it right here. Unfortunately, it's $170, $184 different color variants, and then there's more than $100 of optional add-ons. One of them, sadly, is even the mesh panel that you are probably going to see in just about every review. That's $20 extra. Let's talk about this case and all of its extras in today's review. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA's X570 Dark motherboard. The EVGA X570 Dark is a high-end motherboard for AM4 CPUs, built around extreme overclocking and tested heavily by EVGA's Kingpin. The X570 Dark has a uniquely rotated socket and RAM layout, 90-degree rotated cables for ease of installation and management, and tons of troubleshooting features to make building, testing, and overclocking easier. Check out EVGA's X570 Dark high-end motherboard at the link in the description below. The Evo retains the original appearance and overall stout nature of the O11D. It's more expensive than the original O11D, which was $130 at launch. Neither of them offer fan stock. You have to provide those yourself. But beyond looking sort of similar and also being stout and dual chamber where you've got power supplies and drives over here and everything else over here, there's not much else that's the same, at least not on a technical tooling level, because this has been completely redesigned, reworked, and there have been several tooling changes all throughout the case. So it's more or less a brand new case. As usual, the D version of the O11s are intended to be used with water cooling, but they work completely fine with air cooling, and we found them to be some of the better performers, in fact, even better than the O11 Air when it first launched. That was a tragic combination of uh, excessive mesh and dust filters to the point that it suffocated the case despite being named Air. But those were the early days of what Lee Lee was trying to learn, which was basics of airflow, apparently. Anyway, the O11D series has done pretty well, and the reason, if you're not up to speed on it, is simply because despite the glass front panel and the glass side panel, there's a side intake and it's heavily ventilated. A uh, lot of options to bring the air in. Despite the air coming in and hitting the glass and sort of making an angled turn into the components, for the most part, it works well. Uh, there's also bottom intake, which works fantastically for GPUs because you can't really get much more direct than putting a fan a couple inches below the video card's fans and forcing cool air straight into it. So they've worked pretty well, uh, whether or not it's intended for water cooling. Let's just start with the most interesting aspect of this, though. The thing we wanted to show off is the invertible nature of it, where uh, the point of inverting a case is partly for looks, but then also partly for the... Uh, side of the desk or the floor that you might put it on, where you want it oriented based on where you would typically sit or have your computer position. There can be other benefits than that, like with the Silverstone Raven 02, for example, which is a naturally inverted case. There's not another option. Uh, it actually ends up performing extremely well in that configuration, and it's one of the more interesting case studies in an invertible case. So we've taken off all the panels. You don't technically have to get all of them off of there, but it's a bit easier to do and safer. And now all we have to do is push case entire chassis with the build, mind you, which is pretty cool. Slides forward, and then you lift, and barring any cables underneath, there's the computer. That's the whole thing. You're basically holding that case in your hands at this point, except for the base and then all the panels here. And then flip. I wouldn't recommend doing this with a build in it. It gets a bit cumbersome, but can be done. So we flipped it, reoriented it on the rails, and then you just pull back, screw in these two screws on the bottom, put all the panels back on. It's done. Now the system is inverted, faces the other way. So what this does, obviously, moves the video card to be facing up. That could potentially be really cool as a display piece if you want to show it off through the top. Uh, it could be interesting for water cooling. It could be interesting, too, for air cooling because you've flipped the system, obviously mirrored it, and uh, it completely changes the cooling configuration. So it gives you some more options, but mostly it's just sort of really mechanically satisfying that it's this easy. And to emphasize how easy this is also, so Patrick wrote the review for this, and he and Keegan did the mechanical work with inverting it previously. This recorded on camera is the first time I've personally done it. They kind of pointed it out to me, 
but I hadn't actually inverted it before doing that just now. And it was more or less real time. It took me maybe two minutes minus some wasted time fumbling around trying to realign it on the bottom of the, the rails here. So extremely easy to do. You shouldn't invert it with the system built, especially if it's water-cooled. Uh, don't do that. But the fact that it can be done is just a testament to excellent mechanical design. Enough of all that, though. Let's get into the build notes from Patrick. We'll talk about the thermals that I wrote, and we'll go from there on if this case is actually worth it or not. Side panel attachment is a lot different from previous O11 cases. The front panel and both side panels are now attached with snaps, and they can be removed without taking off the top panel which is still held on with its usual two captive thumb screws. This is the best of all options here because every panel is easy to remove and it can also be fastened securely to the chassis. It would be nice to see a similar tab on the metal side panel, but we've been informed that the production version of the case will include magnets to at least prevent the panels from rattling. The case has changed positively since their power showed it in February, so you should more or less consider this a new case at this point. The hinged I.O. cover front door and the optional hot swap base, for example, have been replaced with a more general purpose drive mounting plate that can be subbed in for the side radiator mount. Lee and Lee also cut down the Type A ports from 3 to 2, uh, but it now has an add-on I.O. kit instead. I.O. ports include two Type A, one Type C, and one four-pole audio. These are in discrete units that can be moved to the left or the right of the case from its stock location at the front. Power, reset, and RGB control buttons are on the left side of the case, but the power buttons wrap around the front of the case and can be pressed from two different directions. On the motherboard side, Lian Li has combined the front panel headers into a single connector, which is a much larger quality of life improvement than it sounds. The kale management channel between the power supply or combined hard drive cage and the side fan mount is so deep now that it's difficult to access the tie points at the bottom. Even though we tried so hard, we weren't able to satisfactorily tie cables down to the included Velcro straps. So in the end, it didn't even matter, and we had given up. It's just a handful of complaints, but we can't help the fact that everyone can see these cables. There are tie points for straps to be run across the whole cable channel, so it's possible to just wad everything up strap it down and bolt the cable cover over top of it without any visible evidence. The cable cover is the same design that's been used in every other O11, but with the welcome addition of a second thumb screw at the bottom. No more forgetting about a tiny countersunk screw and bending the case by accident. The two fan trays at the bottom and top of the case are interchangeable, which is fantastic, especially in an invertible case, because it just makes it easier to work with. Instead of plastic clips that break like were found in the O11XL previously, Lian Li now uses screws. It's much better, much less likely to break also. The star of the show is the side fan mount, which ejects with a spring-loaded lever and can be flipped to mount fans closer to or further from the side panel. It can also be replaced entirely with an included drive mount. This may also be useful for general purpose mounting of items like pumps and reservoirs. Maximum radiator compatibility is listed as 360 mil for the top, the bottom, and the side mounts, all of which are accurate. The side mount has the most potential for conflict with the other two, but it can be spaced back far enough to give clearance to any normal fan or radiator combo. The optional front mount included with the mesh front kit conflicts with the top and the bottom trays, though, and it brings the maximum radiator or fan combo compatibility in those locations down to 280 mil instead. Without the legs, the O11 XL is 48.5 centimeters tall and 47 centimeters deep. The Evo, that's the new one, is 44 centimeters tall and 46.5 centimeters deep. Despite the Evo's XL-ish size, motherboard support is still limited to just ATX, or according to Lian Lee anyway, EATX with the width under 280 millimeters. The motherboard tray cuts off sharply at the width of a standard ATX board, 244 mil for that, so anything larger will hang over the edge. Cable cutouts are perpendicular to the tray, they won't be blocked by oversized boards, but the tray also doesn't offer any structural support beyond just the usual ATX. A returning O11 feature here is the ability to swap the power supply and the hard drive cage placement or remove the hard drive cage altogether and install two power supplies. It's very unlikely you'll need this if you're doing some extremely extreme overclocking, but without LN2, then it starts to make sense, but an unlikely use case. The hard drive bays within the cage are not hot swappable, but they were in the O11XL. So this is a pretty stark contrast between the two. 
The case has two power supply or hard drive cage mounting locations versus the XL3, another big difference. And that gives the Evo's hard drive cage some elbow room, which can also be used to stick a 60 mil fan on any of the four mounting points on the cage. Lee and Lee has moved to a more standard mesh pattern with the Evo, eliminating the need for magnetic filters in all locations except for the bottom of the case. The filters were the cheapest feeling element of the older O11s, and we really don't miss them. The single magnetic filter that is included with the Evo is an unusually complex shape, but it's for a good reason. It's so that it can be shifted over if the case is inverted. And this is some really good attention to detail that we like to see from a case manufacturer. On the subject of the bottom vent, we're a little disappointed to see that the case legs only give two centimeters of clearance versus the XL's still uncontested three and a half centimeters. Finally, we're talking about all the accessories. For extra money, Lian Li offers an upright GPU kit with PCIe Gen 4 riser for a painfully expensive $90. It has a vertical GPU kit for $70, an additional I.O. kit for $20, a front mesh kit for $20, an I.O. kit for the top for $13, and it's basically the car upgrades approach where they just overwhelm you with options and hope that you say yes and add them all to the cart. But there are some actually interesting ones in here. With the separately purchased upright GPU kit, a GPU can be mounted to the front of the case on the optional side drive mount. This is in stark contrast to a typical vertical GPU mount because it puts the GPU in front of the case and leaves all the extra PCIe slots open and usable, and it's also a truly unique display piece. Display cables have to be routed through a rubber grommet at the rear of the case. The grommet is wide enough to fit even DVI connectors, not that you're likely to use those at this point, but the cutout next to the GPU is a bit narrower at 1.5 centimeters. Bulky ferrite cores on HDMI, DisplayPort, or other connectors won't fit. This kit technically works on its own, but because it seals off the side vent, you basically have to use the mesh front panel kit with it as well, and that's an extra cost. So that actually, in reality, puts you closer to $110 to do a GPU in this configuration. And that's on top of the case price. The non-prototype shipping version of the kit now requires the riser cable to be routed through the case interior. Ribbon cables are messy, they're ugly, and they get in the way of everything. Lee and Lee likely had valid reasons for this choice, and it's probably related to signal integrity and length of the cable. But that doesn't make it look better for a feature that's entirely looks driven. We'd be a little happier with this kit if the non-riser cable parts were sold separately or instead. Uh, or just included with the case, they're not that expensive without the PCIe 4.0 cable, because then the kit would just be a couple of metal brackets and some screws. That should be thrown in there. Uh, with it, though, the kit costs more than half the price of the case itself. And again, your cable's going to be on garish display right in the middle of the case in the most visible way possible without even the GPU to hide it because you've moved it to the front. Of course, maybe you want to display your $90 cable in the most obvious glaring way possible just to feel like you got value out of it. As a final note, we found that some holes on the support bracket in our sample kit were not threaded. We asked Lianli about this and they said it was a pre-production issue. We can't be sure whether it actually is or if they fixed it. We had to tap our own threads though on a glorified $90 bracket kit, so we certainly hope they'll fix it. As for the vertical GPU kit, it's more similar to the ones we've seen in the past from Lian Lee and everyone else. The kit replaces horizontal expansion slots rather than fitting in next to them, so GPUs can sit far enough away from the side panel to get some airflow if they are air-cooled. Like the vertical GPU mount in the O11 Air Mini, it can be moved up or down between two choices of mounting location. The upper location leaves four expansion slots below the GPU, enough space for a network card or some other PCIe device. We found that the instructions included with our kit incorrectly duplicated the steps for using the upper mount, uh, so just be aware of that. And the kit only works in normal mode, not in the inverted mode. As for the $19 additional I.O. kit, it's exactly what the name says. The form factor is identical to the stock front I.O., but without an audio jack. It can be mounted in any of the locations that the front I.O. can, and multiple kits could theoretically be added simultaneously if you had a ridiculous board that supported them all. The front mesh kit is the most important of the add-ons. It's the one that we'd make the strongest argument for as an inclusion in the case, even if it maybe affected the price. Uh, this includes a front mesh panel with the same hold density as the stock side and top panels, as well as two fan mounting rails that can be adjusted for 140 or 120 millimeters. The side intake vent is completely adequate for cooling, but the mesh front panel becomes extremely useful if the side vent is blocked by the drive mounting plate or the upright GPU kit. There are very specific dimensional requirements for combining the upright GPU kit 
and the front mesh kit. So get your ruler out. It's important that you check it carefully. The numbers we're showing here are the up-to-date corrected specs from the reviewer's guide straight from Lian Li. Finally, since no one can apparently agree where front I.O. should be, Lian Li has split the difference and has decided it can be everywhere. There's the repositionable I.O. and two-way power button already included in the case, and then there's the top I.O. kit, which is one more option here. This is simply a replacement for the stock aluminum and plastic strip at the top of the case, but with the holes for the front I.O. group. Note that this is designed to match the stock I.O., not the additional I.O. kit. So if you want to use both, then the stock unit has to be moved to the top. This case could easily become a complex matrix of add-ons and the stock options. So do some research on it uh, before you start ordering stuff, because some of these things won't work well with other things that we're talking about. Time to get into the thermals. Testing for this case is complicated, mostly because it doesn't include a set of fans. Lian Li has plenty of suggestions for configurations and its guides, but we decided to do what we've done for the last few zero fan cases. That's using our standardized fan setup, which is applied to every case we review at one point or another. For that reason, we're starting with our standardized fan thermals chart, but with a very strong reminder here, this isn't always the best test, since we're making some cases worse. Normally they get better, but an example of worse one would be the torrent you wouldn't realistically move from its 2180mm front fans and multiple other fans just to 2140s and 1120, but that's what our standard fan test setup is for. We'll include stock results for those cases as well, and we'll talk about them in our torture workloads momentarily, but uh, we're focusing on the standardized test for now. All glass front tests for the Evo were done with 2140 fans side-mounted, and mesh tests were done with them front-mounted. Here's that first chart. The O11D Evo with glass ran at 49 degrees over ambient for the CPU, obviously duplicated since there's no stock fans. Switching to a mesh front panel and moving the fans to the front, we see an improvement to 44 degrees over ambient. That's not a huge jaunt, but it's still a big improvement. You shouldn't use mesh for the front if you're only using side-mounted fans, though, because the air will just leak out of the front. You won't get as much of it to the components. Comparatively, that has the O11D Evo mesh at the top of the chart, ranked alongside other top performers from Lian Li. The H510 Flow from NDXT does poorly with its stock fans at 10 degrees warmer, but the standard did well here. The O11 XL is down at 54 degrees, but it's a much larger case and specific fan position comes into play where it may benefit the CPU or the GPU more than the other. For standard GPU thermals, the H510 Flow tumbles down to the bottom and the O11D Evo falls down as well. It's a big shuffling of the stack. The O11D Evo mesh and glass results were mostly the same, although we saw slightly better thermals with glass strictly because the air is now entering the side, hitting the glass, and getting directed mostly to the GPU. It's not as split between the CPU and the GPU, but overall it's still okay. Lian Li has a stronger footing in the CPU thermals though, uh, but thus far, not a bad start. Torture workload CPU thermals are next. We'll start with the O11 series only, and then we'll highlight all the Evo variants to make it a little easier to follow. You can pause if you want more detail from the other ones. The Lian Li O11D Evo with glass gives us a baseline of 49 degrees over ambient, with the mesh variant baseline at 43.9 degrees. Removing the panel improves glass front thermals, well, you know, without the, the glass, that is, by about 9 degrees. Front mounting the GPU hurts the CPU thermals by about 3 degrees in our testing, but this will vary extremely heavily based on the GPU itself and is not broadly representative of results. Compared to other O11 cases, the Evo is of average performance with glass and above average for the series with mesh, and that's expected. Comparatively, the O11D Evo with our standardized fans ran in the top of the stack. Now, that's with us including good fans with it, so that bumps the effective cost of the case up as well, of course. The Torrent is the best performer that still includes strong fans, and outperforms the Evo by a few degrees, and this is, again, with everyone using their stock fans now. Otherwise, though, the Evo and the Torrent are somewhat comparable in their results. The Lancool 2 mesh stock result also does well and is from Lian Li. Corsair 7000D Airflow is another close competitor with good fans thermally, but obviously it runs expensive at $230 to $260. The glass version of the Evo is closer to the middle, more comparable to the 5000D Airflow or the Be Quiet 500DX. For GPU torture thermals, again highlighting all the Evo results, the worst result was the mesh with a front-mounted GPU, and the best was a glass front with standard fans. Now, again, 
this depends heavily on the configuration you do and the GPU you choose, so it'll vary a little bit, but we have a strong baseline here for comparison. The front-mounted GPU results will be all over the place, and uh, if you use a 3090, for instance, which we don't here, the back of the card will receive limited active cooling in most instances, which will impact the rear-side memory thermals. If you use most other cards, the fin orientation will be the biggest decider on thermal performance. In our instance, we have a taller card and a fin orientation that just doesn't work well with this vertical front-mounted configuration Lian Li has offered. Lian Li gets credit for a truly unique orientation. It's just not impressive thermally with our test setup. For other results, the glass front with standard GPU did okay for our testing, and that's primarily because the side-mounted fans are able to get most of the air to the GPU with less split to the CPU. Comparatively, the Evo was mostly just in the middle of things. The 53-degree result had it notably worse than the O11XL with the same fans, the Lancol 2 Mesh, and also the P500A Digital. Those were all ahead. Firestrike thermals are next. We're only showing glass front results from here forward, but the mesh front scaling will remain about the same in all the tests as we saw in the torture thermals already. The O11D Evo ended up at 52 degrees Celsius over ambient, which has it about the same as when we tested the O11 Dynamic original case with a set of three side intake fans at 40 dBA. But these fans aren't the same between the two, so it's not truly like for like, and that's because it's before we did the standardized fan testing, although we still had standard testing. The O11D Evo ends up comparable to the Silent Base 802 Mesh, which does reasonably but not impressively here, and it's ahead of the 500DX and 4000D with a solid panel. We don't hit notable improvements until we get to the O11XL with our same fans as the O11D Evo, where the XL has benefited uh, and outperforms it here. The O11D Evo in this one isn't impressive, at least with the glass panel. It's not bad, but it's not really that exciting for us thermally. For CPU-only workload while rendering an animation, the O11D Evo ended up at 37 degrees over ambient with standard fans. This makes it equal to the O11XL and O11 Air Mini, also with the same fans. It's not distant from the TD500 and P500A, both of which got recommendations from us in their respective reviews, but this isn't a heavy workload overall. For GPU-only render thermals, the O11D Evo with glass ran at 24 degrees over ambient, allowing the O11XL more of a lead, although not a meaningful one, and overall positioning it centrally in this stack. So at this point, Lian Li has had multiple O11 designs that worked. It could have continued to produce those. It would have continued to sell them quite well in the market, and for the foreseeable future even, but the fact that Lian Li didn't just keep producing the same things that are working and instead decided to get ahead of the eventual die-off in sales of long-standing products, uh, it's decided to innovate, and that's excellent. That's something that is admirable, and more companies should do it. A good deal of case companies are starting to respond well and quickly to criticisms. We, we saw Montec doing this recently. We saw Fractal doing it. Uh, and it gives us a bit more hope than for perhaps some of the rest of the industry where we're mostly looking at duopolies. So great to see, though, Lian Li pushing forward and trying to do something new, and they do get points for the easiest conversion process we've ever seen. It's easy to forget also what a huge step forward the Evo is from the original O11D, which overall we liked, but we had some criticisms of. One of the biggest ones was there's only one spot in the O11D where 140 millimeter fans fit. So big change forward for that. The reason it's easy to forget the shortcomings of the original O11D is just because Lian Li has continued to launch O11s with incremental improvements, and most of those are included in the Evo. The mesh, the kale management, and the reversible slot in fan trays are all things that we've seen in other Lian Li enclosures by now, and we're happy to see them come to the dynamic flagship version. Now, the biggest problem with the case is probably pretty obvious at this point. Uh, no included fans is okay but the pricing is a bit steep for no included fans and not really getting everything that should probably be included. So the upright GPU kit, it's just a couple of metal brackets. They're really cheap to produce compared to everything else in here, and they don't include them. Instead, you're forced to buy it separately, and that forces you to buy the riser cable that Lian Li has chosen, which brings the cost up to $90. That's the bulk of the cost. Uh, in other words, if you have your own riser cable, Technically, just the brackets are not sold separately. You could probably email them and ask extremely nicely to buy them and use one of your existing riser cables, but that's not how they sell it. Now, the other sort of shortcoming here is that it doesn't include a mesh panel. And the reason it's a shortcoming is not because of our usual complaints about thermals, because this thing does fine with a glass front and side-mounted fans, just like the original O11D did. It's okay. Yes, the mesh panel helps. It's not necessarily, though. The reason that it becomes a bit of a potential stumbling point for a builder is because there's so many different aspects of this that can be tweaked, moved, 
modularly changed. You can slot in all of these DLC add-ons from Lian Li itself. Because of all of that, it means that there are some really specific fitments between the components as you move things around and deviate more from the sort of stock version of the case, which is not even this, because I've flipped it over. So what that means is just as you're working on designing your build, take careful measurements and make sure you're going to be able to fit everything you want where you think you will, because as soon as you start changing panels, change the GPU location, obviously the uh, specs Lian Li has provided for what fits where won't really match anymore because you are moving away from the stock layout. The biggest ATX compatible alternative to this that's competitive with it right now in terms of looks, stature, all of that, is actually Lian Li's other case. That's the O11 Air Mini. It's closer to the $100 mark, $110 or so, and it'd get you most of the looks here. It's a bit smaller, though, so that's a limiting factor, uh, and it'd be a lot cheaper. So that's something to consider. If you're looking at this, you really like it, you can't justify it, look at the O11 Air Mini, see if that'll work for your build. That'd be the closest you can get without uh, leaving Lian Li's brand. At $170, $180, there's a ton of competitors out there. A couple of them just quickly, Corsair 5000D Airflow or solid version. The 7000D is worth looking at as well. Be Quiet Silent Base 802. There's also the Fractal Torrent, which got our case of the year award. It's really not that distant in price at this point, especially once you start kitting this out with all the optional add-ons and DLC options. So tons of good competitors. Take a look at our reviews. Our case reviews playlist will be linked below. See if there's something you like better. But uh, this case is extremely well built mechanically. It's it, it, very competent design, sound, well put together, uh, and intuitive. And Lian Li has done an excellent job with all of those aspects. For thermals, it's OK. It's good, depending on how you configure it. There aren't any stock fans. That's 100% up to how you build it. And that'll pretty much wrap this one up. So as always, you can go to store.cameraxis.net if you'd like to help us out directly. Our Volt mod mats, the large mod mats that have been out of stock for months now, are back in stock and shipping now. If you want to guarantee you get one, place an order soon because they sell through fast. Anyone who had a back order, yours will be shipping out in the next week or so after this video. Uh, and you can also go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus just to help us out directly. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.